Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Horn Call podcast. My name is James Bolden. I am the publications editor for the International Horn Society and your host. On today's episode, we have an awesome conversation with Dr. Margaret Tung, who is the visiting assistant professor of horn at the University of Kentucky. She has uh, a number of really uh, amazing performance credits. Uh, she studied with Dale Clevenger, Bill Vermeulen, and uh, a host of other uh, uh, notable names in the horn playing and teaching community. We had an awesome conversation. We talked about her article on horn choirs in the October 2020 issue of The Horn Call. We talked about balancing uh, personal and professional life and obligations. I just think she's got a really interesting story. And so I don't want to take up too much time getting to our conversation. I do want to mention that uh, as we are uh, now into episode four of The Horn Call podcast, I have totally forgotten about doing this in the previous three episodes. But if you like what you're hearing, please head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. Um, I'd love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with me at editor at hornsociety.org. I'd love to get your feedback both on the podcast and on the Horn Call Journal. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Margaret Tung. Podcast is Dr. Margaret Tung. Thank you so much for being here and giving up part of your Friday evening to, to talk to me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and I I uh, know from our kind of our warm up conversation a few minutes ago that you're balancing a lot of different things right now. Do you want to maybe give the listeners a little bit of an overview of what you're doing right now and the kinds of stuff you're balancing in your professional and and uh, your professional and personal life, if you want. Sure. Um, I'm at the University of Kentucky, and uh, we just started this semester in August hybrid. Um, uh-huh. And so about 50% in person, 50% online. And so we're doing a hybrid model there at the university. And then I'm doing all of my studio classes in online because the space um, isn't large enough for horn studio class and so i got that going on um and you were saying so are you you're teaching your student your private lessons online i'm doing half in person half online and so i'll start uh so i'll have half of them and then the next week i'll switch sure so they at least get to see we get to see each other every other week right yeah in person I think a lot of places are doing that too. Um, and you teach a studio class there as well. Uh, any other, what else do you do there? Uh, horn choir okay. is the other big thing. And um, and we started it as a class last year, my first year. And that's been really, really fun. Mm-hmm. I love horn choir. And I first started conducting a horn choir at my first full-time university teaching job at the University of Akron. Mm-hmm. And I really wasn't sure what I was inheriting. I had never played in a full-time horn choir for a class myself. Um, and I had just known that there was this tradition that was happening there and I inherited it. And I was just really amazed at all the benefits that there are with having a horn choir. Sure. And, you know, not only just the playing benefits, but I feel like the strongest benefits is the, the mentoring that Mm -hmm. happens in a horn choir and it's like you know the one time a week that the freshmen get to play with maybe the doctoral students right um and uh so just those kinds of pairings and the studio just becomes really really close because of that yeah and Um, it is is so interesting to see those interactions that you might not otherwise get to see you know mm because like you said they're never all going to be in the same ensemble like an orchestra or a band together (laughs) yeah for me, having a horn studio that gets along 
likes to hang out with each other is really, really important and um, is something I try to really foster that kind of camaraderie. Um, and I think it comes from studying with Bill Vermeulen mm -hmm. at Rice University. And you would think that, you know, it'd be a really competitive place and, you know, but it was, it was quite the opposite. It was so supportive and it was directly fostered by Bill Vermeulen. Mm -hmm. And he always said to us, the pack is stronger than the lone wolf. Absolutely. And, and so we always tried to work together. And if, you know, someone was having an off day or wasn't feeling great, you know, we just invite them, invite them out and just keep, keep everyone in the studio at a really high level and doing stuff together. And that's, I feel like a unique experience that I had at Rice. It is a very tight knit studio from what I understand. And there's a lot of personal attention and it is a very tight knit studio. So no, that's awesome. And you actually have an article about horn choirs, don't you? In the October, 2020 issue of the Horn Call. So that's, let's get that plug in there for sure. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. Um, you know, due to COVID, there wasn't really opportunities to play anymore, but I mm -hmm. had this desire to continue to do stuff. So I wrote an article. No, it's really exciting. Yeah, we appreciate that. And uh, um, the October issue, by the time this episode goes out, the October issue should be in everybody's hand. If nothing else, people will be able to get to the digital copy online. So, and you've got a lot going on outside of your, your job at the University of Kentucky, right? You mentioned you've got uh, a little one in the house, right? Ah, uh, yes, Jasmine. Um, she is almost a year and a half old and she's just been this complete game changer. Um, so before my job at University of Kentucky, I was at the University of Akron for five years. My husband is a trombone player. His name mm -hmm. is Joseph Rodriguez. And, you know, the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra trombone position comes open. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wow, you know, it is it is four hours away, but I think we can do both. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just the dream of having, we've always had this dream of two musicians having two full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And so we're in Akron and it's my first year there and he takes the audition and he wins which oh my is goodness. amazing yeah and so you know we've always just supported each other in our careers so much um and so you know i would never want him to not take a job and he would never want me to not take an opportunity mm -hmm. and so we're just like we can do both you know we always kind of imagine that and so um for yeah i think four years um we had dual residencies Oh, wow. In Cincinnati and Akron. And we would just drive between the two houses um, on the weekends. Wow. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, it didn't seem that crazy at the time, I think, because when you're in it, you're just kind of doing it and you, you know, you got your blinders on and you do whatever you need to do. But, mm -hmm. you know, I would go to Cincinnati maybe twice a month and he would come to Akron maybe twice a month. And so it, turned out that we could see each other almost every week okay and so for us like it was like it was great it was you know me and my husband turned into three cats and a dog <laughs> that sounds like a pretty busy life yeah that sounds like a pretty cool life <laughs> when we started we only had the two cats yeah <laughs> um <laughs> so, so, so i kept the cats um and he kept the dog and the dog would travel Oh my um, yeah, it was pretty funny because sometimes we'd have to travel with three cats in the car Ooh. and a dog, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it was like a we had like a zoo in the car. <laughs> um, anyways, we just like were super excited about our jobs and about um, where life was taking us and and uh, just pursuing as much as we we possibly could. Um, and so Let's see, my fifth year, I had gotten pregnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it also just gone off for tenure and everything was going really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and got like, you know, unanimous, unanimously voted positive um, for that. Um, but, you know, I was pregnant at this point and so not really sure what to do. Um, I love my job. 
my husband loves his job. We're going to have a baby <laughs> soon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the University of Kentucky job had come open. But before that, um, I remember looking at a map and saying, where would I want to be if mm -hmm. I were to go closer to Cincinnati? And in my heart, it's the weirdest thing. It was always University of Kentucky. Huh, interesting. And we had actually taken a visit to UK before the job even became open because I mm -hmm. was just, I don't know, I just felt at home there. I felt connected to the university for some reason. And, you know, we just went and checked it out and That's went to awesome. the student center and I don't know, just kind of did some positive visualization, I guess. Um, sure. And uh, so the job comes open and, uh, you know, not sure what to do. I'm about to get tenure at my job. Maybe I can have a baby and <laughs> try back and forth still. I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's not possible. And so we go on our baby moon <laughs> <laughs> in <laughs> December, I think it was. Um, and uh, as I'm on the plane, uh, we went to Hawaii. As I'm on the plane, that's when I apply for the job. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, because um, things just became more real, and I was just like, you know, I'd be kicking myself if I didn't, and so let's do it. We're just going to jump in. Let's just do it and see mm -hmm. what happens, and, you know, we'll go from there. And I hear from them, and it's awesome. The person that calls me is Brad Kearns. Mm -hmm. um, I just have to say the brass faculty at UK um, are just some of the most supportive kind, talented, um, just the best colleagues I could ever ask for. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just really, really amazing. Um, and so they invite me out for the live interview, which is really, really great. And I had just uh, gotten to the nine month pregnancy mark. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> It's um, 36 weeks pregnant. Um, were you still playing at this point? Still playing the horn? Yep. Yep. I think I had played a wooden quintet re a recital just a couple weeks before that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so part of the interview is, of course, a recital. And you know, these university interviews last all day, right. many, many meals. And um, it's just a really uh, physical and mentally, um, grueling process. Um, but, uh, I just made it a point to say mind over body and just do it. And, um, <laughs> I remember, you know, practicing for this recital. It was like a 30 minute recital. And I had just like made the decision in my mind that I was going to stand for the recital and mm -hmm. I was really proud of myself because I did I remember I put like a chair behind the piano in case I had to sit or something like that but um you know I would get home from Akron and um prep for this interview and prep for playing the recital and I remember just getting home and just being so tired and barely being able to hold my horn up to like practice for this recital mm -hmm. um and uh but it was cool like i i did it and um it uh i had really really great uh female mentors along the way um mm -hmm. one of which is a dear friend um elizabeth frymouth mm -hmm. who plays principal horn in, in cincinnati symphony and um she was just such a positive um inspiring person uh going through pregnancy and playing. I remember, mm -hmm. you know, getting getting the call that I was going to do a live interview, do a live recital, and I remember texting her right away and saying, can I play a high quality recital when I'm nine months pregnant? And her answer was, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, I played even better when I was pregnant. And I was just like, okay, here we go. Um, and so I feel really fortunate that I had a friend like her um, to help me through all of that um, because they're, or, you know, they're, they're female brass is a little bit more rare. And then um, also, you know, 
having to go through the pregnancy and playing and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so I did it. That was really neat. And the cool thing about it was, is I just felt, you know, I, I, I was just the genuine me. I didn't have energy to be better than I was or <laughs> something different than I was, you know, <laughs> at the interview or outplay myself that day or, sure. you know, I just went there and, you know, it was just really authentically who I was and was just like, well, you know, if they like it, it could be a really good match and, you know, just, right, just right. was myself and it was really cool and I enjoyed myself and enjoyed the company, enjoyed the students. Mm -hmm. enjoy the food um and so yeah, yeah and lexington, i knew lexington is a really nice town there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff yeah there. yeah and i and i knew that if they hired me that they understood it all mm -hmm. that they just got it um you know that they were really supportive of hey having um like i was i am their first uh female brass faculty at university of kentucky Okay. And wow. so hiring, yeah, pretty cool. It's a really great honor. Um, but I just knew that if they hired me, they got that and they got that they were hiring um, someone that was going to have a newborn mm -hmm. at the start of the job. And so um, I went in um, feeling supported mm -hmm. and I think I always was, um, but just knowing, knowing that, you know, there's just a great atmosphere to be at to be a mother, to be a professor, to be a musician, um, and to be given the opportunity to flourish in that way. No, that sounds really awesome. I, I have a question, and this is sort of like getting into the nuts and bolts of things. Of, so obviously, you're you be you're incredibly busy, right? You're you're keeping a lot of things in the air. You've got a, a baby. You've got this full-time teaching job. How are you able to kind of balance all that and keep your playing up to the level that you want it to be? Um, are there any, you know, tips or hacks or things you found along the way that that would be, you know, good to share with other people who might be going through the same thing? That's such a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I remember uh, after having Jasmine and, you know, I took a break, a little bit of a break. And I remember mm -hmm. coming back to the horn and I was just like, how is this even possible to practice? <laughs> this is crazy. This is just like madness. <laughs> this <like> doesn't <laughs> seem possible. And again, I remember asking my good friend, Liz Feimuth, and, you know, it's just like, how do I get it in the practicing? And she was just like, you know, just do 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. And it mm -hmm. all adds up the same. Mm hmm and so I, I really had to learn how to practice differently. I didn't really have those hour, two hour chunks anymore where I could sit down and um, intensely practice. And, you know, there, it's kind of getting better now, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, still, <laughs> it's still challenging <laughs> to be away for long periods of time. Um, and so I guess that now I'm able to get done what I need to get done because a, of all the work I put in in the past, mm -hmm. all those uh, solid fundamental work, um, just having a really, really strong sense of a fundamentals and a foundation of horn playing that I can access quickly. And I've just learned how to solve things quicker, practice more efficient. And mm -hmm. I don't have the time that I used to have anymore, but um, of course, I try to keep the level as high as possible um, by practicing just as efficiently as possible and practicing really smart, I guess. And mm -hmm. so I don't have to practice. It's uh, quality over quantity now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, even taking taking being a new mother out of the mix, just balancing a career as a teacher mm -hmm. and trying to find the time to practice. I, I mean... Uh, it, I'm, I'm sure your level of efficiency has just gone through the roof, uh, you know, having to balance caring for a baby and, you know, finding time to get all of the things that you need to get done, uh, you know, personally and professionally, just finding a way to make it all work. But I think it's, it's really good for people to hear that it is, it can be done. It can be done, um, for sure. And it, it takes a lot of, um, 
perseverance. <laughs> a lot of laughs as well. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and I think just, you know, squeezing in these small, small practice sessions um, mm -hmm. is really important. And then, you know, for I, I'm okay with paying someone to watch Jasmine so that I can practice. Mm -hmm. You know, and then same thing for my husband because you know he he's he still needs to practice too, and so we've both really yeah. had to function differently. Um, yeah. You know, because prior to having Jasmine, really like we were kind of in separate households, <laughs> so it was just <laughs> yeah. a major major shift. Yeah. Um, you know, I could come home from a work day and. I would often just spend the rest of the evening just essentially working mm -hmm. emails, um, practicing anything. I would do that yeah. pretty much every day, all through the weekends. And I feel like very, very grateful that I had my job at the University of Akron because I was able to figure out a lot there and mm -hmm. figure out the things that were more high impact for a horn studio mm -hmm. or for teaching and the things that mattered more versus the things that maybe took a lot of time but didn't really have much impact in what I was doing. And mm -hmm. so coming into UK, I felt confident um, with just the priorities that I needed to have and um, how to navigate those things. No, I agree 100%. And that I think that's something that for whatever reason, there's this assumption that you know if you're a new university professor and basically any discipline although in music it tends to to maybe run a little more is that you just have to be working all the time that you should just never stop working and i it's so unhealthy because mm -hmm. you burn yourself out you're not going to be very productive and so you know I've, I've i've been at this a while and you know when i was coming up in grad school i i had some good mentors who tried to you know, make it clear that they balance their work and family life or, or whatever that was, their personal passions and their and their work life. And that made a big impact on me. And so I think it's good for people to hear that, like, you can have a real life. You can, you don't have to just be working 24 seven. And in fact, that's not good. That's not healthy. That was my takeaway last year at UK being my first uh, year there was you know i feel like i'm a better teacher and i feel like i'm a better role model for my students because what i was doing before really wasn't sustainable at all <laughs> <laughs> you know and um it wasn't sustainable and i didn't have great balance and um i'm glad that i can show a healthier balance to my students now because before mm -hmm. i was just all work all the time you know just and and i think it was good at the time for where I was, um, but I think for sustainability and longevity of career and just overall happiness, <laughs> yes, yeah. just to have some balance. <laughs> yeah, and it, I mean it's it's a marathon; it's not a sprint. Although it can feel mm -hmm. like a sprint sometimes, just getting that job or you know playing or teaching or what have you, and then getting tenure, and then you're on to the next thing, just boom, 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 boom. But I mean, you know life life has to happen in there somewhere <laughs> yeah you yeah wanna a, you want to be a whole person <laughs> for sure yeah for sure <laughs> yeah well no that's awesome and you said your daughter's one and a half yep she'll be a year and a half um in a couple weeks yeah well, that's that's so cool and congratulations Thanks. um let if, if you have uh, a, a more time let's maybe talk a little bit about um your role with the international horn society if you want to talk maybe maybe let's take us back to like how you got into the horn society and how you came into uh the position you're in now with uh working with social media oh sure you know i just wanted to become more involved with the horn mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. and uh i just ended up emailing the executive director one day and said is there anything that I can do for you guys? To, <laughs> is there, are there any points that you guys need help with? And uh, Julia is so amazing. And um, she just emailed me back very, very quickly and just had like, you know, five or so different things, different points that uh, she could need, use some help with. And, mm -hmm. um, and so 
I thought I could do the Facebook one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I think I could do this one. Um, but so it was just kind of me having interest and then reaching out and saying, how can I be involved? Um, and thankfully, it must have just been a, a good time to do that. So, uh, so I help with the Facebook page mm -hmm. and the International um, Horn Society. Yep. I just mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that Julia just talked about is modernizing everything and just trying to reach more people. Um, and so she's really organized about all of this. And so for me, she's um, given me a spreadsheet pretty much of things to post about, which include like information on honorary members um, mm -hmm. and the different scholarship opportunities and awards. And so I'll typically only post about IHS related topics. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. So yeah, big shout out to Julie Bercher, uh, executive director of the IHS. I know she's going to listen to this because she listens <laughs> to the podcast. Hey, Julia, <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I would say too, that like, that is an amazing thing for you to just email and say, can I help? I That's like the best thing ever for an organization like the IHS or any kind of nonprofit that is basically you know, they don't have a ton of paid employees. The majority of the work of the society gets done by volunteers. And so I, you know, that's, that's awesome. Thank yeah, you for doing uh, that. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. And I had only emailed with her, but the energy that she has in her emails is so amazing and so positive. Um, we actually invited her as a guest on Zoom to one of our Horn Studio classes because I was just like, I need to share. It's like, they need to know who she is. And she's just has this energy about her that um, people just gravitate to and, um, you know, just makes IHS even more exciting. And so that was actually the first time I had met her was mm -hmm. over Zoom. Um, but it was just really cool that I got to know her over email and just see how amazing of a person she was just through her emails. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lots of, lots of capital letters. Yeah. Of capital no, that's, that's awesome though. No. And uh, she is the absolute right person for that job. And we're, we're very lucky to, to have her. Yeah. I think kind of what's in the works and, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for Julia, but I think part of the overall vision is to, have a cohesive social media strategy across the different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, so on and so forth and what have you. And it, I mean, you know, I, as, as I think people are beginning to understand now more than ever, social media is a tool. It's, it's only as good or bad as what it's used for, you know, and I think it's something that the IHS can capitalize on to, to promote our interests as, as horn players and, and people that love this instrument and want people to, to share their love of it and to share, you know, share something that's good in their life. Cause that's, a, that's, that's a beautiful thing right now when there's so many other uh, less positive things going on in the world that it's, it's nice to coalesce around. <laughs> we all love to play the horn. We all love music. Let's temporarily forget about all the other stuff. And, you know, let's talk about, Mozart for a bit, or do you love long tones, or do you hate long tones, or something? You know. <laughs> yeah, I I've just been so um, happy and like pleased with just like the depth of everything that IHS has to offer. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I remember going to my first conference. I don't remember when. It's like many years ago, but you know, being really nervous about it, and um, you know, like I don't know if like you know, what the vibe will be and mm -hmm. like, will it be too much for me or, you know, I just didn't know, but um, just being involved, the horn community is just, I find just so supportive. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think I feel really lucky to be a part of that community. And, um, and I think just, you know, these conferences, like, hanging out with everybody there is just awesome. It's just really, mm -hmm. really awesome and can't wait to get back to it. But um, I just think this community of horn players is just really great. And um, and it's really great how I just brings it all together. No, that's that's fantastic. And yeah, so I, I really appreciate all the work that you and also Maddie Tarantelli, who is uh, in charge of the Instagram page for the IHS. So uh, 
those of you listening, keep watching those pages, the IHS Facebook page, IHS on Instagram. It's also on Twitter and also on YouTube. So um, mm-hmm. there'll, be, there'll be more content coming out and on a more regular basis. So just keep your eyes on that for, for more stuff. Um, I, I wanna take just a minute to kind of circle back around to the, the Horn Choir article that you've got. Could you talk a little bit about, so you mentioned that sort of a, um, treating it as, as a real class, as, as a sit down ensemble, so to speak, um, that wasn't necessarily part of your training coming up, but when you got a university job, there was the understanding that now horn, horn ensemble or horn choir is a thing. How did you kind of gear yourself up for doing that? How did you, you know, what are some tips or pitfalls that you kind of uh, ran into that might be worth talking about? Hmm, another good question. You know, when I first started, I just really didn't know the rep. Mm. And so, you know, I played a couple pieces here and there, but I think the b- biggest learning curve at first was learning the rep. Mm-hmm. Um, and so at our at the library that um, Akron is at, they had a pretty good uh, resource of horn choir music. And mm-hmm. so I started there, um, dot, did lots of interlibrary loan, um, mm-hmm. you know, then you start building your own library, do tons of listening and, you know, it's really cool time right now because people are being really creative and there's pieces that are coming out now and, um, just lots of, lots of music out there for horn choir that I really didn't know about. Mm-hmm. And so first was just getting to know what the rep was. Right. Um, I think I got better at it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How, so how did you work on your conducting? Because I, I, I always feel Woo! like I feel so awkward because, I mean, I've watched a lot of good conductors and I try to, you know, sometimes I'll try to like do a fancy cue that I saw one do and it never goes well. But, you know, I, is there, you know, how did you work on your technique as a conductor? Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Well, in my doctorate at Ohio State University, I decided to take conducting lessons with um, the band director, Dr. Mickelson. That's really smart. That's really smart. (laughs) I don't know what, I don't know why. I I think I just admired him as a teacher so much. And I just enjoyed like playing in his ensemble so much. And I I just wanted to learn. I just knew I wanted to learn more from this person. Mm -hmm. And so I took conducting lessons. And now when I look back, I just cannot believe he... A accepted me be like could have put up with me because I just knew nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, and so I think that that helped a lot and uh-huh. um, just gave me the confidence to kind of know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like he gave me the tools to be able to conduct a work choir. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm sure I'm sure I could use brushing up all the time. <laughs> So, yeah, so I uh, thought that, and then um, I think, you know, along the way, I've asked, like, different conductors just for help here and there, Mm -hmm. Um, and just just always been open to help and just open to information. So, but I was really thankful that Dr. Milkelson had me buy a baton, Mm -hmm. (laughs) just, Mm -hmm. like, these basic (laughs) things that I probably had no idea how to hold a baton. Yeah. Um, Well, and so hopefully I'm okay in that department, but I, I'm not, you know, not a conductor for uh, sure. <laughs> by nature. No, it's funny because music, at least, you know, what, what we do and kind of the, the path we follow sometimes it's so compartmentalized, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I, I, uh, that's really smart though. I wish I'd done that too. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I think was just like, you know, like what we do is, like the teaching part is mostly just one on one, and and then you have to be in front of all these people and, and seem yeah. like you know what you're doing. Yeah. So that was something to adjust to as well. Um, I felt like at my former job, I I learned how to lead with a larger number of students versus just mm. an, a one-on-one and feel confident doing it, you know, or just mm-hmm. pretending I felt confident for a long time. Um, so, but just being comfortable, I think in that, sh- in those shoes took a little bit of time um, just because the nature of what we do is so one-on-one or if you're playing, you know, in an orchestra or something like that, 
you're not the conductor. <laughs> right. You have to worry about everybody when you're, you know, conducting the, the horn choir. But when you're playing in the horn choir, your job is to worry about you. So it's such a different it's such a different role to be listening to the ensemble as a whole than just listening yeah. to, to how your part fits in. I also think the horn choir got better because um, at first, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, first, first, <laughs> I, could, first I would, you know, I would just like hand out parts and whatever people wanted, they would take and we'd read mm -hmm. and it sounded okay. But I felt like once I got to know the students better and I learned what their strengths mm -hmm. were or what their needs improvements were, then I started assigning the horn parts and that just seemed to raise the overall level mm -hmm. yeah. of the group. Um, by not, you know, only that really helped the level of it. Um, but of course, like I would take opportunities like, hey, you're working on, you know, maybe a lower register, let's put you on an eighth horn part. Of course, I would mm -hmm. still do that, but um, that's something that I felt changed um, the level of it easily, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, that makes <laughs> um, sense. Yeah, and you talk about the mentoring uh, that you see going on. Could you wanna talk just a little bit more about how how that how that plays out in an ensemble uh like a horn choir yeah it's awesome because um you know it's the it might be like the one or two times a week or one time a week maybe where a freshman might play with a graduate or doctoral student mm -hmm. and so the mentoring happens in different ways a just listening to that person play mm -hmm. like what what is the level of the studio what is the you know the top level of the studio um, what can I achieve? And so just listening. And so a lot of times for the horn choir, I'll assign um, two two players per part. And, mm -hmm. and that, in my mind, I just kind of always think about a mentoring process there uh, where I'll put maybe like an older student and then maybe a younger student. And so then the younger student will get an idea of like, oh, okay, I need to prepare my my music at this level oh, okay, like, wow, I need to play with this kind of dynamic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so forth. And so that's purposeful. And so just the playing part does a lot, I think. But then I also think, um, you know, for me, like one of the most rewarding parts of teaching is just watching these students grow and develop, not just as musicians, but as people. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool to like get, you know, a freshman and, um, you know, just watch them grow and mature as they leave their senior year um, mm -hmm. as people. Yeah. And to have that maturity um, in the horn choir, I think, does trickle down in that kind of leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And so and so that's why it is really important to me that the the overall camaraderie of the horn choir and that everyone gets along is just really, really important. No, I agree. And it's it's interesting to watch people that are a little a little more shy, watch them kind of come out of their shell once once they feel comfortable in the group and they realize that this is a safe space and that they can be themselves and that they're not being judged. Um, it, it is it is a pretty cool thing to watch that. And it, it's also cool that you know, every, you know, when a senior graduates or a grad student leaves that kind of whatever leadership role that person might have been filling is now available. And sometimes we, you know, as teachers, I'm sure we kind of think, well, okay, this person might be the next leader in the studio, or this person might be filling the shoes. And sometimes it's that person, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. someone who you might not expect, who just happens to step up and kind of, because that person who was the leader is now no longer there, that leaves a room for someone else to grow and to, to step into that responsibility. And it, it is a really amazing thing. I agree. I, I try to uh, rotate the parts um, all the time in horn choir. And so, mm -hmm. you know, someone that might not be playing principal in a large ensemble can get the opportunity to play that in horn choir. And mm -hmm. so it can be a really fulfilling experience. And um, I find that with students, if given the opportunity, um, they, like to rise to the challenge cool. yeah i love horn choir yeah it's been a lot of fun <laughs> do you have a do you have a favorite piece or some favorite repertoire that uh Let's that you like see. well we're gonna be playing at um kmea this year which is okay. pretty cool and um so we're cycling through some rep now um 
probably one that's fun, really fun to play is Robin Hood. Okay, yeah, the, from the score, the Michael. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's a good challenge for everybody. Um, that's been a favorite now. Um, uh, there's a Hansel and Gretel piece, of course. Uh -huh. It's really standard, yep. Yep. and um, I think that's the Hornets' Nests, or maybe yeah. Like Okay, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I have this arrangement of um, Oblivion by Piazzolla for horn soloist and then, like, horn choir that I probably Ooh. will program on there, too. So that might be kind of fun. Yeah. Is that, so. a, is that available on on the market? Can you get that? You know, I, it was the trombone quartet. There's a trombone piece. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um i had someone just write it out for horn oh that's awesome i might I, yeah uh, i might have to pick your brain about that because yeah, yeah i'm sure. always i'm always on the look for stuff i i have to take this opportunity to put in a plug for the ihs online music sales like there that's another great place to if you're kind of trolling around looking for music for any number of combinations um check that out because it's all digital download you just you know pay and it shows up in your mailbox uh, as a PDF. And there's actually recently, there's quite a lot of horn ensemble music that's shown up there, lots of great arrangements. So um, that that's a definitely a plug for the IHS online music sales. Sure. Yeah. But no, that's that's really cool. And then there's, of course, there's, there's the war horses, like the old LA Horn Club stuff, like the um, Roland Lopresti stuff. There's the color contrast, George Hyde, that that's the one where you have to like pull your slides out and play on the tubes and there's you like blow through the turn the mouthpiece around and blow through it. it's kind of an effect piece but um, okay yeah it's it's kind of hard to get i think i got it on interlibrary loan somehow and it was just like basically in pieces though because it's such a it, it's it, i don't think it's published anymore but it, it is a cool okay. piece um no i would i would check out the uh the old la horn club recordings because there's there's some really good stuff on those too that's kind of the some of the old standards of horn ensemble music. Yeah, it's just it's just fun. It's just mm -hmm. fun when and it's sounds amazing like to hear just a lot of horn players playing together. It just makes yes. my day. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I remember talking with Doug Hill about this one time and we were just you know, we were just kind of talking about different pedagogical things and the the topic of horn choirs and ensembles came up and he was like, you know, part of the reason he's doing that is he's like when else am I ever going to get to conduct the first movement of Beethoven five? Well, eh. there's, an, there's an arrangement of it for horn ensemble, you know, so that's that, that gives you as the conductor that musical opportunity to, mm. to actually conduct a piece like that. And then it also gives those students the chance to play the violin part to Beethoven five, which they're never going to do in the orchestra, right? Cause they play horn, but it's important for them to know, uh, you know, what the other instruments have and by actually having to sit there and try to play it. <laughs> right, uh, right. That, that's, that's another good learning opportunity for them. I find the rep in horn choir challenging. Oh, yeah. Generally. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it's like, it can be extreme high to extreme low. Um, there's usually bass clef reading in a horn choir. And so that's just a really great, like, you know, freshman coming in Yep, you gotta learn bass clef, and here's why. <laughs> this is the practical application. Here you go. <laughs> exactly. You know. Yeah. No, and you watch their eyes when they see that bass clef part. And yeah. There's not. There's nothing in treble clef, and the whole part. <laughs> <laughs> the pencils come yeah. out, and they start feverishly <laughs> writing in. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for talking with me. Is there anything else you wanna? You wanna any any ground we've not tread that might be interesting? Is there anything you wanted to talk more about? I never know what I'm supposed to talk about. I just talk, <laughs> I just talk and sometimes cool <laughs> stuff comes out and sometimes not utter nonsense comes out. Just ask my wife, like, <laughs> like but no, I would say you're a very good host, very good host. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And you know, th thank you again so much. This has been really awesome. Uh, and, and thank you for being here. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.